This video is sponsored by Vikings War of Clans. If you enjoy top-down strategy games set in a time when Vikings ruled the world, then you should check out Vikings War of Clans. Build settlements, command heroes, and craft items to conquer your enemies. Sign up today by clicking on the link in the description below, and not only will you be supporting our channel, but you'll also begin with a protection shield and an additional 200 gold to aid you in your conquest. Our story begins during the first years of the second millennium. For the last 200 years, settlements throughout Europe live in constant fear of being ravaged by two groups of ruthless pagan raiders. Hungarians, who assaulted the European interior, and the Norsemen attacking mostly along the coasts. But it wasn't only a mindless plunder. By the beginning of the 11th century, the Vikings were already deeply involved in the local politics of the weakened western duchies and kingdoms, and more often became concerned with trade than raiding. But since our channel is not really about trading, we'll focus on the latter one, which didn't just cease in a matter of days. It's the year 1008, and the Norse raiding party under famous Thorkill the Tall plunders the coasts of the eastern Baltic. Among his men is 13-year-old Olaf Haraldsson, one of the descendants of the first king of Norway, forging his own way to wealth and respect. It was initially a rough journey, as on one occasion Olaf's party was ambushed and decimated by Finnic tribesmen in southern Finland. But over the next few years, their luck improved, ravaging the English coasts and entrenching themselves in local politics. King Ethelred eventually paid a huge amount to be rid of them. But ironically, a couple of years later, Olaf assisted the English king in his fight against the Danish invasion of Sven Fortbeard and his son Canute. In 1013, Olaf found himself plundering the coasts of the Western Iberian Peninsula, possibly on his way to the Mediterranean. There's a story that Olaf dreamt about a powerful man urging him to forsake his plans and sail back home in order to become the king of all Norway for all time. Obviously, this could be allegory, but Olaf apparently followed these instructions and set sail back north. He wintered at the court of Duke Richard of Normandy. Olaf's kinsmen in northern France settled there two generations earlier and now were westernized Christian warriors and scholars. There, young Olaf was impressed by stories about mighty Charlemagne, of his deeds and how he built the Frankish Empire. These stories left a long-lasting impression on the young man, and in early 1014, Olaf was baptized in Rouen Cathedral. Soon, he departed Normandy and set sail back to Norway. The country was divided between various local chieftains, but the most powerful were the Jarls of Lauda, formerly retainers of the Danish king. But at the time of Olaf's arrival in Norway, King Sven Forkbeard of Denmark was already dead and his son Canute ascended to the throne. Olaf saw this as an opportunity and offered Canute his help to regain control of England. While Olaf's contribution to Canute's reclaiming of the English throne remains unclear, the success of the latter eased Olaf's way to the throne in Norway as his most influential opponent, Jarl Eric of Lauda, was appointed Earl of Northumbria by King Canute. Thus, in 1015, Olaf took this advantage and crowned himself as King of Norway. In the following years, Olaf made efforts to consolidate his rule over various petty rulers across the country, showing his ability as a commander and politician. But aside from his desire for power, Olaf, as an ardent Christian, wanted to enforce the new faith among the Norsemen. The thing was, that while faith in Jesus already reached many settlements in coastal Norway, the more remote inlands still worshipped old Norse gods. Yet Olaf was ruthless and determined. He let the sword pave the way for the cross, coercing his people to the new faith. In 1024, Olaf convoked a moot in which he declared Christianity the official faith in Norway. This was an unpopular decision, which made him new enemies. What's more, Olaf's further decisions to refit the existing laws to Christian law and strengthen control over local lords using men from his own guard garnered serious opposition among the nobles of Norway. 
Yet King Olaf's reforms and harsh Christianization methods couldn't spark enough fire to threaten his position. The real danger to his rule was located abroad. Knut Swenson, King of Denmark and England, was well informed regarding Olaf's doings in Norway and perceived him as just a mere tributary king and a subordinate. He dispatched a letter to Olaf reminding him of his position and urging him to recognize Knut's supremacy. Unsurprisingly, Olaf refused to do so, possibly hoping that Knut would actually be too busy with affairs in England and Denmark to even bother with Norway. But he was wrong. In 1026, Knut led a large fleet to deal with Olaf and his ally, the King of Sweden. But the naval clash that followed was largely inconclusive, with considerable losses on both sides. Subsequently, Knut learned about Olaf's internal problems and began supporting his opposition, buying them with promises and treasuries. He also turned the Isle of Lauda against their king, and just after his pilgrimage to Rome, Knut set sail to Norway. Olaf had no means left to maintain his fight against Knut, and with vanishing support from his own nobles, he was forced to flee into exile. Olaf sought refuge in Sweden, and then within the court of Grand Prince Yaroslav the Wise in Novgorod. Soon after appointing Hakon, the last Lauda Jarl, as Earl of Norway, Knut sailed back to England. Hakon's appointment wasn't the most fortunate, as he drowned at sea in 1029. Olaf learned about Knut's departure and Hakon's death, and perceived this as an excellent opportunity to reclaim his kingdom. In early 1030, he arrived in Sweden with his most loyal followers, where he was reinforced by Swedish Vikings who, ironically, were still predominantly heathen. Olaf's force reached Trondelag in the summer of the same year and headed to the Verdal Plain 70 kilometers north of Nidaros. Although Norwegian sagas indicate that Olaf gathered several thousands of men, it's more likely that his host consisted of more meager numbers. They set a camp on slightly elevated terrain near the town of Stickelstad. Olaf probably assumed he would be able to gather a significant following in Norway once the news of his landing had spread. But we'll never find out if this would have actually happened, as in the last days of July, a hostile army entered the plain. The king's return caused two influential chieftains, Kalf Arneson and Thoria Hund, to challenge Olaf and defend Knut's status quo in Norway. Their troops were probably less hardened, but of far superior numbers, forming an army more than twice the size of Olaf's, but still counting no more than a few thousand men. Olaf didn't have a viable battle plan, and most likely was surprised by the size of the army he was going to face. The hill they camped on wasn't reinforced by any field defenses, and Olaf's only hope to win the battle was to do the unexpected and strike downhill at the enemy's superior numbers. Both sides clashed at the base of the hill, forming two shield walls, striving to gain an upper hand in the melee fighting. The battle was long and bloody. Many men on both sides died, but Olaf's forces, despite trying to hold their ground fiercely, was gradually pushed back. As the death toll rose, Olaf's inferior numbers were gradually worn by casualties and could no longer repel the enemy. Eventually, according to law, having been wounded three times, King Olaf fell dead against a large rock. His troops scattered, leaving the victorious Kulf and Thoria's army on the battlefield. The abrupt end of Olaf's campaign left Knut as the undisputed King of Norway. Yet in the following years, the harsh reign of Knut's son, who was summoned to Norway to rule as his father's deputy, made the Norwegian nobles realize that during Olaf's reign, their positions were not nearly as eroded as they were under the later Danish rule. One of the significant signs that Olaf's popularity grew immensely after his death was that his son, Magnus, ascended the throne five years later and was supported by Kalf Arneson, his father's opponent near Stuckelstad. Olaf's reburial a year later supposedly revealed that his body had remained preserved, untouched by time. This marked the way to his canonization by the Bishop of Nidoros shortly thereafter. 
the king's heroic last stand at Stickelstad and his efforts, though often brutal, to Christianize Norway, bolstered his popularity in the country long after his death. The cult of the king martyr was additionally sanctioned by the Norwegian church, and over the years he became regarded as Norway's patron, serving as an important nation-building figure in the emerging Norwegian state.